Hi, this is Pastor Lutzer, and I suppose if this video were to be given a title, it would be Sermon Preparation Made Simpler. Let me tell you my story. I was the graduate of a seminary, and I was told that you had to study a passage to study its context and key words and what have you, and I agree with all that. But I did all that. My desk looked like this with commentaries, with ideas from this commentary, with an illustration here, and here's a word study, all spread out on a table. That, of course, was before the days of computers, all spread out. But you know what I didn't have? was a sermon. How do you achieve unity, order, and progress in a sermon? Oh, find the big idea. Well, yeah, I had the big idea. I knew the subject. I knew the predicate. I knew what I wanted to communicate. But what do you do? Do you stand up on a Sunday and say, here's the big idea, folks? And then you pronounce the benediction? How do you develop that key idea? And how is the passage being developed? Now, here's what happened. A professor of homiletics by the name of Lloyd Perry said to me 40 years ago, he said, let's have coffee together here at the Moody Church. We used to have actually at the Moody Bible Institute what we called a coffee cove. In 10 minutes, he changed my sermon preparation I caught on in 10 minutes, and if I got it in 10, my friend today, you can get it in eight minutes. But the reason I'm going to be speaking to you for 15 is because I'm going to take you a little farther down the road than Dr. Perry did so many years ago. I'm so thankful for him, he's in heaven now, that I have said, I want to explain this to other pastors whenever I have the opportunity. I gave this lecture in Canada and an older man, a pastor was there who resigned his ministry to invest his life in other pastors. He heard me and he said, I wish I could begin my preaching career all over. Over breakfast, sitting in the shadow of the Parthenon in, uh, in uh, Athens. Here's a young pastor who's excited, but he has to preach on the book of Ephesians, he shows me the passage and he studied it and he's analyzed the context. How do you put it together? I showed him and now I think he's going through the whole Bible and developing sermon outlines on every chapter. I hope I'm not overselling this, but it certainly was transforming to me. Oh, the idea in seminary was that if you study it all, somehow out of it an outline will arise. Well, yeah, I think that's true in the writings of Paul, but it sure didn't help me when I was talking about Moses in the desert. I need something simple. You know, when I was pastor of Moody Church, I always prayed that God would keep me simple, and my staff thinks that he's overdone it. They said, don't continue to pray that prayer. That prayer has been answered. Well, let me show you what we're going to do. I'm going to give you one example after another, and then we're going to look back reflectively, and then you are going to leave beginning your own process of sermon outlines. By the way, pick up a pencil. You don't need it now. Don't take notes now, but at the end, I'm going to give you some words that I want you to write down, and I want you to be ready for that. Well, let's suppose that you're talking about Moses in the desert since I raised the issue. There he is, and your big idea is that there are issues and lessons that we can learn in the desert that Moses could have never learned in the palace. The desert taught him things that the palace couldn't have taught him. If that's your key idea, I preached on that one time, and my key word, let me introduce to you, a key word is a plural noun under which all of your points are subsumed. It is not a word in the text. It's not a word like justification and so forth. There are those key words, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a plural noun. And I use the plural noun, lessons. So after giving my intro and background and all, I come to the transitional sentence, which always contains the key word, and I said, now what we're going to do is to look at three lessons that Moses learned in the desert that he could never have learned in the palace. First of all, 
the lesson of humility and service, the lesson of trust, the lesson of obedience. I mean, there in chapter 3 in the book of Exodus, he's standing on holy ground arguing with God. So there are lessons. The, my key word was lessons which gave unity to the essence of my sermon. For example, one day I was going to preach on the woman, the Canaanite woman. What a marvelous story about Jesus going to the district of Tyre and Sidon. I look at this. What do you do with it? I mean, here's a persistent woman wanting to get help for her child. And it dawned on me. I said, you know, I'm going to talk about the barriers that she overcame to get her child to Jesus. And just like that, reading the text, five barriers came immediately to mind. The barrier of her religion, the barrier of protocol. A woman did not meet 12 men. And by the way, where was her husband? We don't know. He may have been dead. He may have been working in the field. But here's a mother who goes on behalf of her child because she's desperate. Another barrier is the disciples. They said to Jesus, send her away because she's bothering us. You'd be surprised at the number of people who are turned off to the Christian faith because of God's disciples. And then the words of Jesus. You know, Jesus saying, look, you know, uh, Lord, help me. He says, it is not right to take the children's bread and feed it to the dogs. The words of Jesus. Now, in the message, what you want to do is to explain all those. But my key word was barriers that she overcame to get to Jesus. By the way, I used the word barriers also when I was speaking about Caleb one time. How do you take Caleb's life and give it unity, order, and progress? I listed five barriers he overcame to follow the Lord fully. Barriers was my key word. Now, there are many, many different examples. Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I'll build my church. I look at it and say, what is there here? And um, I look at it and I use the word features. I said, there are four features of the church. Of course, you give an introduction and you, and by the way, I'm going to do another video on intros and conclusions. Because I have to tell you that many a mediocre sermon has been pulled out by a powerful, life-changing conclusion. I'm not dealing with that today. I'm just talking about the essence of the message. So I use the word features. I said there are four features about the church here. And, you know, you give your key idea, the big idea, etc. Christ owns the church. Christ builds the church. He preserves the church. The gates of Hades can't prevail against it. And he empowers the church. I have given you keys to the kingdom. My key word is four features of the church. Overcoming guilt, 1 John 1, 9. What do you do with that? You want to explain it to your people? Well, I use the word steps. I said there are three steps to overcoming guilt. First of all, you have to confess to something. You have to admit to something, namely your sin. You have to believe something, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. You have to believe something. You have to receive something, not only forgiveness, but cleansing. There are plenty of people in our churches who've been forgiven, but their consciences have never been cleansed. But my key word was steps. Now I have to tell you something. The human mind wants organization. We're born that way. So you know what many pastors do? Many pastors who didn't have the privilege that I did by having a cup of coffee with Dr. Perry, they use the word things. Now that is a key word. They'll come to a passage and say, now there are four things I want you to see here. Yeah, and then next week, here are three things or five things. You know what the problem with the word things, it is a key word, it is a plural noun, but the problem that you have with it is that the word things gives no direction to the message. And then what are you going to do next week? Have more things? You know, there was a guy who uh, called me. I mean, actually, he emailed me, I should say. And he wanted to do a message on these words in the book of James. He was given this passage 
because he was part of a church that had many different pastors. I'm going to get to that passage in just a moment. And so he, he emails me because this is Wednesday and he needs to preach on Sunday and he's studied the passage and he's looked at the commentaries, but he doesn't have a coherent sermon. He doesn't know how to package it. Well, I was at a conference and uh, I went to breakfast early, uh, perhaps uh, 10 minutes early. And so I sat on a bench and took my phone. Yes, I do have the Bible on my phone. And I looked at this passage with a piece of paper and in about 10 minutes, I uh, came up with an outline. This is the outline of the passage. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow you'll go into such and such a place. You're acquainted with this. I'll give you my outline. I said, I looked at it and I said, you know, there are temptations. What I'm going to do today is to give you five or four temptations that businessmen face. Of course, you set it up. You talk about the need to do business God's way and all. But after you've done that, you have four temptations. What are they? The temptation to presumption. You say today we'll go into such and such a place and spend a year there and trade and make profit. The, the temptation to ignore the brevity of life. What is your life? It's like a vapor. I'm hurrying here because I want to stay within my 15 minutes. The temptation next to take credit for what God does. You boast about what you are doing. You boast in your arrogance. Another temptation is to do what you want rather than what you should. The passage indicates and ends by saying, whoever knows what to do is right and fails to do it for him, it is sin. So I email this to him and he says, thank you. I told him, I said, you'd better tell your congregation that I helped you a little bit because I might want to use this, this outline myself someday. Now, do you see you say to me, Pastor Lutzer, I get the point, but how do you know which key word? Well, there's no real magic connected with this. This is not uh, a scientific. What you do is you read the passage and then you discover the direction that the passage leads and you choose a key word in relation to it. For example, it's Easter and you're preaching on uh, 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul is talking about the resurrection it is a why passage, W-H-Y, and what do you do? You teach it, and of course your key word, immediately you know, is reasons. Let me give you some reasons, or maybe four reasons, maybe five, I don't know, why Paul believes we should believe in the resurrection. Your key word is reasons, because it's a why passage. If it's a how passage, probably your key word might be steps. If it's a what passage, my, that's all over the map. You have all kinds of options. Now, I told you to take a pencil and a piece of paper because in a moment, I'm going to give you some key words. And uh, you say, well, how many key words are there? Actually, I have to tell you that I have photocopied a list from a book that has over 100 key words. I mean, we're talking about a page and a half, but you don't need all that. You need just some basic key words and those basic keywords, I use about a dozen or so keywords. Let me give them to you. A word like aspects, reasons, characteristics. I love characteristics. I have this message that I preach on characteristics of a grasshopper complex. You remember the children of Israel there in, in the desert They're saying, you know, we, we are like grasshoppers in their sight. When I speak on that, at a banquet or something, and I come to the transitional sentence. Now today I'm gonna to look at five characteristics of the grasshopper complex. What are people doing? They're, they're wanting napkins, they're wanting a piece of paper because they say, this guy's organized, he's going somewhere, and what's gonna give it all coherence is that word characteristics. Ways, I'm doing a message now on the fear of God, a brand new message, and we illustrate our fear of God in these ways. That's my key word. Gifts, blessings, contrasts, instructions, benefits, realities, temptations, tests. Did I hurry too quickly? I'll give them to you again. Aspects, reasons, characteristics, ways, features, gifts, blessing, contrasts, instructions, benefits, realities, steps, temptations, tests. I was doing a sermon on the man 
of the Gadarene who was demonized, Mark chapter 5, struggling with how to put it together. I just said my keyword is going to be questions. What I'm going to do is to answer five questions about this man found in this passage. Uh, the question of uh, where did he live? How did he act? What did he feel? Who did he encounter? Obviously, Jesus. How did he prove his deliverance? So I've analyzed it, but the coherence was the question. Can I tell you this? I've actually written whole books based on the key word. For example, I've written a book entitled 10 Lies About God. I know you haven't read it because there are only two people that have read it, <laughs> actually a few more than that. But the point is every chapter was another lie. The key word was lies. Now I have an assignment for you because my 15 minutes is just basically running out, I think. Turn to Romans chapter five when this session is done and read the first couple of verses and ask yourself, how would you outline this passage? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, obviously what you do is you introduce the whole issue of justification, which lies at the basis of all of these blessings. That was my key word, I think, when I preached on it, the blessing of peace, the blessing of access to God, the blessing of joy and trials, the blessing of the Holy Spirit and love. So there was coherence there. And those, that coherence helped me to preach a message that had unity, order, and progress. Now you begin to do that you know, 2 Corinthians has a very interesting passage. I know that I'm probably over time, so I'm not going to give it to you, but I've been doing this for 40 years. And oftentimes my outline just grows out of the English text. Of course, I study the context and I'm in favor of all the word studies and so forth, because those enhance my outline. That's the food that makes it all Ago, but at least I have an outline that goes in a certain direction. Unity, order, and progress. Packaging. Turn to the passage that you want to speak to. By the way, instructions. You're, you're teaching the Apostle Paul. Well, you're in Timothy. Maybe the word is instructions. Paul gives these instructions to Timothy. You don't have to make it all rhyme. You know, the uh, position of prayer, the power of prayer, the whatever else of prayer, people will remember it better when it's whole sentences, when you have a key word that gives direction to the passage. That's been transforming for me. I've been doing it for many years. I hope that you begin that journey as well. God bless you. May you be encouraged in your study of the word. And thank you so much for joining me in this particular lecture on sermon preparation made simpler. God bless you and you have a good day all day. Thank you.